different half. And it's just like he just says all he's doing is just like cataloging. So he's not really, you know, going back to stuff. Although we encourage him to go back to stuff. So he didn't have something really interesting. All right, we will get started in one moment. I need to know this and I'm going to um, leave the door there open for a little minute um, to see in case there are any stragglers, uh, but then I will be closing it because I don't know about you, but I actually find it incredibly distracting at a talk if there's a door open. I just can't concentrate on anything. So welcome both to the people who are uh, in the room and the people who are online. Um, and welcome also to those people in the future who will be watching the recording of this presentation. Um, this is the second and the last for the fall um, instance of our Pedagogy in Progress uh, series. I'm very sorry that uh, co-conspirator Angel Nieves um, of the Humanities Center is not able to be with us today to, um, to co-introduce this with me. Um, as probably everyone here knows, I my name is Laura Green. I am the Associate Dean for Teaching, Learning, and Experiential Education in the college. Um, and the Dean's office is very pleased to uh, support the Pedagogy in Progress series, which I think has a fairly self-explanatory title. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to remind you, uh, we heard about generative AI in the classroom back in October, thanks in part to Vance, who is here. Okay, sorry, I'm done with the door now. Um, we will, we have two, we have actually three sessions scheduled uh, for the spring. On March 11th, uh, we're doing a combined uh, uh, presentation with the Faculty Works in Progress series, and that will be on uh, teaching and research in the digital humanities. Um, I do not yet have the list of uh, speakers for that for you on April 25th, we will have the Outstanding Teaching Award winner um, presentations. Those award winners always share with us, um, you know, what it is that excites them about teaching and a little bit of why they were recognized. And I don't have that list for you because the call for nominations has just come out. So I'm remind, I'm taking this opportunity to remind you um, that we give awards for tenured and tenure track, full-time, non-tenure track, part-time lecturers and uh, graduate student instructors. So please, uh, and actually the full-time non-tenure track includes also anyone you could think of who is an instructional position, including co-op coordinators, professors of the practice. So um, if there is an outstanding instructor of some kind in your life, please feel free to nominate those people. There will be a third as yet unscheduled pedagogy in progress presentation um, in, the, uh, in the spring. And that is uh, being organized by Amy Farrell of Criminology and Criminal Justice and Elisa Lincoln, um, our colleague in sociology and also in Bouvet. And that is going to be on teaching in the context of vicarious trauma. Um, and again, unfortunately, I think the need uh, for such an event um, does not require explanation. Um, okay, onward to today's uh, series. Um, I am going to introduce the speakers all at once, but in the order that I expect them to pre be presenting in, um, which will be starting with Nicole. Um, no, which will be starting with KJ. Yeah, um, that's totally fine. Um, the order of the slides. That's great. And uh, the I will give fairly brief uh, introductions because I have a militant belief that in the age of the easily available Google function, um, we should not take up too much time with introducing our colleagues, um, but actually allow them uh, to speak um, for themselves. So, KJ Rawson, our first speaker, is Associate Professor of English and of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. He is also the co-director of the New Lab for Text, Maps, and Networks. Um, and his research and teaching are at the intersection of the digital humanities and rhetoric, LGBTQ+, and feminist studies. 
uh, focusing on archives as key sites of cultural power. And you're going to notice in two of our speakers a kind of archival thematic, at least two of our speakers, uh, focusing on archives as key sites of cultural power. He studies the rhetorical work of queer and transgender archival collections in both brick and mortar and digital spaces. He is the founder and director of the Digital Transgender Archive, which by the way has a lovely um, sticker that you can put on your uh, computer, an award-winning collection of trans-related historical materials, and he chairs the editorial board of the Homosaurus, another great sticker, an LGBTQ plus linked data vocabulary. Our second speaker, Nicole Aljo, is professor of English and Africana Studies. Her research focuses on 18th and early 19th century Black Atlantic and Caribbean literature with a specialization in slave narratives and early novels. She has published a monograph, Creole Testimonies, Slave Narratives from the British West Indies, 1709 to 1836, uh, and several co-edited collections. She is also the co-director of the Early Caribbean Digital Archive, there's that word again, housed at Northeastern, a member of the Mapping Black London research team, that's with our colleagues at Northeastern London, and contributed in that capacity to the development of the Unforgotten Lives exhibit, which explores the stories of African, Asian, Caribbean, and indigenous Londoners who lived in the city between 1560 and 1860. Um, really cool uh, work um, in a context that most people are unfamiliar with. And finally, our last speaker, Madhavi Venkatesan, is Associate Teaching Professor of Economics. She has published three economic textbooks to date under the series A Framework for Sustainable Practices um, and has a number of other volumes in the work. In 2016, Dr. Venkatesan established Sustainable Practices a 501c3 nonprofit with a mission to quote, facilitate a culture of sustainability as defined by reducing the human made impact to the planet and its ecosystems within Barnstable County. Hi. Ah, uh, do we have a tech issue? Okay, thank you. Um, Abhishek will help you. Um, uh, where were we? Impact to the planet and its ecosystems within Barnstable County, Massachusetts, where I believe you live. Is that correct, Monavi? No. Kind of, I okay. Partly there. Partly okay, there. where she partly lives. Um, and this organization has actually had several plastic bottle bans adapted, adopted in the county. Monavi's academic interests include the integration of sustainability into the economics curriculum. So that was more ado than sort of I promised, but without further ado, um, I don't know, KJ, if you want to come to the podium. Sure. Probably the easiest to. thing. Um, and I think, yeah, and there is water, by the way, available for our speakers at the podium. All right. Thank you, Laura, for that introduction. Um, we were asked to keep these two at 10 minutes at most, so I will be um, quite fast in hopes that we will also have time for a conversation. But my goal today is really to share with you a bit about the Digital Humanities Lab um, that I run and support a lot of different types of student work in. Um, in case you thought that Northeastern students have gotten a lot younger, that is my 10 year old in the front of that photo <laughs> who never misses a DTA party. Um, so if you're not familiar with the Digital Trends Archive, I thought it would be helpful just to first explain what the project is. And I'm gonna be super fast with this so I can tell you more about what the students do. But if you haven't visited the site before, it's digitaltransgenderarchive.net. The basic premise of this project is that we provide greater access to trans historical materials. It's a freely available website. It was launched in January of 2016. So it's been around for a bit of time now. We have 77 different institutions that have contributed materials to the site from 10 different countries. So this is a really large scale digital humanities project huge collaborative infrastructure involved in getting all these materials up. There are a little over 11,000 items available on the site now. What is really cool about this number is that every single one of those has been touched by an undergraduate student. So every single item that is on the site is there because of the diligent and longstanding work of undergraduate students with this project. Our collections go back to the 16th century, though that is quite misleading because most of our content is from the second half of the 20th century. Lots of reasons behind that. 
happy to talk more about it. Really, I want to explain more about how students are involved in the process of getting all of this great stuff up. So our digitization occurs in a variety of ways, but some things are digitized here at Northeastern on site in, uh, in the lab space that we use. Some of the content happens at actual archives. So students will travel to archives and digitize on site there. And then in some cases, if there are particularly rare sensitive items, we have to ship it off to a special digitization service because we don't have the equipment to do it. Um, but most of the processing for our collections does happen with the students in the lab. So I thought it would be helpful just to give you a sense of how many students are involved. And um, this is actually quite a difficult slide to write because I wanted to tell you all about them. Um, but essentially what we have is a leadership team where which two PhD students generally take the helm of. Um, right now we have two English PhD students. That has um, not usually been the case since I've been in Northeastern. So we've had um, students in criminology, sociology, um, several different uh, in history as well, who have been on our leadership team. So it's been a really great place for um, graduate students across a few different CSSH disciplines to come together. Our team, our student team, this is a pretty like good example of what it looks like. Every semester it's a little different. So usually it's a majority undergraduate students who are part of our team. Um, most, so all of the undergraduate students this semester are in paid positions because we have an external grant that is funding these students. Uh, we have uh, two graduate students who are currently working in volunteer positions. Um, one is a data science master's student and master's student and the other is in bioinformatics um, who are really excited about database design and building and wanted to join our team for that purpose. And we also have one master's student at Simmons who's doing an internship with me. Um, I could take on probably 10 to 20 Simmons students every semester. They're always <laughs> banging down the door. Uh, but this seemed like a particularly good opportunity for this student. Um, and then we also have one student who's doing a, a peak project. Um, so there's a really big range of different types of students. They have um, eight different majors. So they're really coming from a variety of different backgrounds, which is part of what's really fabulous about our team. So what are they actually doing? And I have to admit, I'm cheating with this picture because this is actually a picture from one of my classes when I took them uh, to the Schlesinger Library. Um, but we have had students go there <laughs> to do some work, so it seemed fair enough. But what students do is they, um, in part, are establishing relationships with archivists and librarians. This is usually the graduate students who are doing this work. They're going out into archives. They're meeting folks. They're bringing them on as part of our collaborative team. Um, they are locating trans-related materials, so they're trying to actually find the content that will then make its way onto our site, and they're evaluating which of those items we should prioritize. So there's a lot of a power in these roles. Once we have the materials selected and ready to, to process, that's when the undergraduate team really kicks into high gear. So their role is to digitize physical materials, prepare the files, and what that might mean is redacting sensitive content or flagging content that needs to be uh, framed in particular ways. They organize collections, which is a really important epistemological framework. So they're not just like throwing things up on the site, they're thinking about where it belongs and what it belongs in relation to. And then students are also uh, creating metadata to make items more searchable. So what that means is you take, uh, say, a newsletter from the past and you have to decide if someone were doing historical research, how would they be searching? What kinds of terms would they use if they wanted to find this object? So again, really important role. So all of the items that are on the DTA have gone through undergraduate students who have worked in these, on these items. And then beyond the lab. So as you can probably imagine, there are lots of ways to take the work that they're doing in the context of our space and going beyond that. So students are presenting at conferences and symposia regularly. I think this semester we've had five student presentations in various contexts, and that's about average, I'd say. Um, they do a lot of tabling at local events or um, anytime there's like a history related LGBTQ thing happening in Boston, we try to bring someone from our team into those spaces. And then they're traveling to archives. So they're really trying to go out raise awareness about the DTA. So even for people who aren't collaborators with us yet, the students are really um, part of the face of our project. 
then there's lots of student driven research as well. So these are more instances where students are coming to me saying, I want to do this work uh, and can I do it in a more sustained way? Will the project help to support it? So we have had one co-op student in the past. We don't have the funding for that. So if they are able to cobble together funding from another source, um, I have supported that before and it was a phenomenal experience. Um, we have students doing peak awards. We've also supported independent studies. Again, there's so much content in the DTA that there's a lot of material to work from. Um, and then lots of students are doing things from course assignments as well. The last thing that I'll share, again, because I get a lot of questions about this, is like figuring out the mechanics of how we're actually collaborating in this space. So I meet with the lab coordinators weekly, and we communicate on Slack all the time in between. Um, the lab sessions themselves happen four to five times per week, and they're two and a half hours long each. So the students are slated into a couple sessions. Who are the lab coordinators? The um, grad students. Okay, yes. <clears throat> yeah. Sorry, maybe I should have had it closer to that slide. Um, so those lab sessions are two and a half hours long. We meet in the new lab common space, which if you start adding up the numbers, we're really hogging that space. <laughs> it's not quite fair. And I will, I will be honest with you, that space has been a problem. So the DTA does not have a devoted lab. And that has presented a, quite a few issues for us. We have bounced around to a number of different spaces um, in the last four years. And uh, there have been times we've been kicked out of spaces <laughs> and haven't been able to do our work. Um, so just thinking about like actual physically getting together is an important part of the project, but it's also one of the hardest parts and it takes a lot of like logistical organizing that, it, anyway, I just wanna include that as part of the challenge of doing this work. Um, but I also wanna say in candor that part of the structure of the lab is also to protect my time a bit. So the coordinators really help um, to buffer me a bit from the weekly, like, I can't attend lab because of X, um, because it's very hard to coordinate a lab of 15 students on a weekly basis. So the coordinators are really my point of contact and that gives them also a really important leadership role and experience. Um, so we talk on Slack all the time. The students are always on Slack, chattering with each other, which is great, posting lots of pictures of pets and funny things they see during the day. Um, they mostly stay in touch with the lab coordinators. And then just some of the expectations that we have in the lab. Again, I'm not gonna go into this in detail, but we always work collaboratively. So even when we're processing items, no one works alone. So they're always working side by side with someone to work on that. Then someone else, another group will look at the work that they've done, the lab coordinators will look at it, and then I'll look at the work, right? So we're really deeply collaborating in the lab and our project values are central to everything. So I think I will end it there and turn it over to Nicole and look forward to the conversation. And I should have said, as we think, uh, KJ, that we will hold questions to the end and, and be able to speak with all of our panelists at once. So please keep any questions you have in mind. Thank you, Nicole. Okay, hello, everyone. Um, so, um, let me start by saying that there are a lot of similarities um, in terms of the projects that I'll be talking about and the projects, um, uh, the project uh, that KJ uh, just shared with you um, in terms of structural organization, in terms of workflow, um, similarly multi-generational groups work, that I'm working with, undergraduates and graduate students. Um, we do weekly meetings, we have project, individual project managers, that kind of thing. Um, so I'm going to be talking about three projects um, today. I know we were supposed to focus on a case study, um, but it was hard because all of them kind of relate to my research. Uh, so I thought that might be a little more uh, meaningful. Um, so the um, uh, foundation of all of the projects that I'm doing um, is this quote here that's often attributed to um, Marcus Garvey, but it actually comes from a Barbadian um, his, um, historian. Um, and this idea that right um, history, our, our origin, past culture is super important, um, right? It's not just something that's in the past, but also um, really in important <coughs> ways relates to and informs the, the present. Um, so the first project I'll talk about is the Early Caribbean Digital Archive, um, which is basically an archive of pre-20th century um, Caribbean materials. Part of the problem um, with doing research in the early Caribbean um, history, early Caribbean literary studies, is that the archival material is all over the place. Um, some of it is incomplete. Um, not all of it is actually in the Caribbean. Some of it is in very bizarre places um, like um, uh, you know, uh, Pennsylvania um, out <laughs> in weird places where you wouldn't normally think. Um, but there were lots of, you know, Moravians and Quakers that were in the Caribbean. And so that's the reason why 
Um, so um, our, our goal with the ECBA is not to replace these physical archives, but basically just to make um, that research um, a little more accessible. So you can check out our archive and then actually physically go to the, go to the archive. Um, but the most important part about um, the ECDA is this the second point um, to understand the colonial nature of the archive and to use the digital archive as a space for remix and reassembly. Um, and so um, one, uh, the, one of the um, foundational experiences that I had with working with uh, graduate, graduate and undergraduate students in terms of my research is the experience with ECDA, where my first book um, looks at and makes an argument about Caribbean slave narratives. Um, Caribbean slave narratives are very different than US um, slave narratives in that um, they're all explicitly mediated, so usually written by someone else, and they normally appear in other kinds of texts. So they appear in biographies of, or in autobiographies of other people, travel narratives, medical treaties, um, uh, historical texts, all kinds of things. But they're not singular, um, you know, published kinds of things. Um, so they're what I call embedded slave narratives. And the problem, um, the other problem, is that you have to read through, um, quite honestly, a lot of horrifying dreck. Um, and just racism and just awful stuff to actually get to these narratives. Um, so um, given that we were working with the early period in the digital archive, I asked the question a couple of years ago, you know, can we digitally excise these texts and have them exist in the archive on their own? Um, and while some historians are not happy with that, mm -hmm. um, we did um, give them, you know, all of the embedded narratives um, now have their own metadata. So they exist in our archive as, as separate items, but it's much easier to see them now. Um, in the past, you had to know. So this is um, Brian Edwards' history of the West Indies, which is one example of these incredibly racist historical documents. Um, but there's this really wonderful footnote um, here and here um, that is uh, there are two slave narratives, and they're they're, they're super interesting. Um, but again, you wouldn't know that these narratives were there unless you knew Brian Edwards and you'd read all of that awful book. Um, so I'm saving you from reading that awful book. Um, and um, so we were able to excise them. And what we did was we had graduate students actually go through these documents initially, um, and then they transcribed the narratives. And now this narrative exists on its own um, in our archives. Um, and that was such a really, it was a really wonderful experience and really wonderful to see all of the documents together, um, which, are, which are right here. So it gives you a really, um, a really wonderfully textured kind of um, representation and understanding of enslaved life um, in the Caribbean. So we're in the process, worked so well, um, we're in the process of doing it again. Um, so I'm now working with a couple of undergraduates. They're going through some other container texts and we're going to add um, to, this, to this exhibit. Um, so that, this was the beginning of the working with uh, graduates um, and undergraduate students in terms of my research. Um, so one of the um, public facing and most, uh, yeah, most gratifying um, has been the early Black Boston Digital Almanac. Um, so that's um, a riff on Ben Franklin um, and um, 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 Banneker's, um, Benjamin Banneker's Almanac, 18th century almanacs are these really crazy compilation of all kinds of interesting stuff. Um, and that's kind of what I wanted to emulate. Um, and so um, this has a longer backstory, um, but what is key here is that um, it's a way to um, engage with and represent the fact that uh, 18th century and 19th century Boston is a diverse and dynamic um, place. It's not just the home of Paul Revere and Sam Adams, right? <laughs> there are lots of people of color that were here involved um, and we wanted to make that history available to people. So um, I, ha I, t I normally teach early African American literature. Um, and I used to have the students write, you know, the regular, um, you know, literary history documents, close readings, all of that kind of thing in terms of their final papers. Um, because it's a kind of lower level English class, I would get students who are not English majors. Um, those papers were not always satisfying um, to read or, or effective. Um, and so I thought, the dynamism and just the inclusiveness of digital projects would make the a final project a little more interesting for the students, but also for me um, to read because the students would feel, I think, a little more empowered, and that has been the case, to build on their um, on their strengths, um, right, um, in terms of creating exhibits. Um, so all of the exhibits on the Early Black Boston Digital Almanac are created by undergraduates. Um, and um, so, so, so some of it obviously relates to some of my research in terms of um, early Black Atlantic, um, but a lot of it is connected to students' own interests in music, um, in politics, um, in spirituality, um, things like that. 
Um, so um, this is just, I just love this picture. Um, mm -hmm. But um, so this, this is just the um, one set of the exhibits, the exhibits that focus on literature and arts um, and Black Boston military history. I just wanted you to get a kind of sense of what the exhibits are like. Um, but again, these are all um, undergraduate um, created. And so initially, I just thought this was a public resource. It would just kind of hang out online and people would go to it you know, as they needed to. Um, and I was um, approached um, by a Boston Public Schools teacher who had been teaching at the Edward M. Kennedy Health Careers Academy that used to be located here on Northeastern's campus. It's no longer here. Um, but he heard about the website, heard about the projects, and wanted to um, maybe use it in his classroom. Um, and so that started this whole other really um, wonderful aspect of the project um, where we started working more directly with Boston Public Schools teachers um, and creating exhibits and, and creating um, curriculum material that the students um, and the teachers could use in their classrooms. Um, and this was particularly important right during COVID when they literally couldn't go anywhere um, and that so they could have access to this website. So we've run a couple of um, workshops with Boston Public Schools teachers, um, I think six um, by this point, um, where we introduce uh, teachers to the website, introduce them to our curriculum materials, show them how they can work with um, digital tools. And these are all accessible tools. So none of them are tools that they need to spend, you know, thousands of dollars to purchase or anything like that. Um, and um, so we've, uh, the, it's, it's just been just a really great experience um, in terms of, you know, working with Boston Public Schools, but also feeling like this material is um, actually being used um, in the schools. Um, and one of the ways that we were able to get it to be used in the schools is the fabulous Savita Maharaj, um, who is a 2022 graduate um, in English. Um, she's now a PhD student in English um, at Brandeis. So Savita received a P grant um, to actually tie the curriculum um, that we've developed on, um, on the EBBDA much more closely to Boston Public Schools um, the um, teaching benchmarks. So they're like the, the, um, like the, their pacing guide is what they call it. Um, and you know, where they're supposed to be at a particular time of year, like the topics they're supposed to focus on, um, that kind of thing. And so what Savita was able to do was to take that material and tie it to the Massachusetts state standards. Um, so it becomes that much easier for the teachers to use that material. Um, and, and again, just really um, enhances the utility so they don't, so they don't have to, I mean, right, they, they have so much on their plates already. The last thing we want them to have to do is to think about how they can turn this material into something they can use in their classroom. Um, so um, yeah, so this was the peak, um, and this was Savita's uh, capstone um, that she used um, uh, to support the development of this. Uh, so let me see what else is next. Oh yes, so the last thing. Um, so the last thing is um, just connecting to what Laura had said earlier, um, which is talking about the my work with the Mapping Black London project, which is um, obviously in London, working with my colleague, um, Oliver Ayers, who's in history um, in London. Um, and um, so this project, so this is the mapping, this is the first iteration. So this is the Ignatius Sancho's London map. The Mapping Black London project develops out of this. Um, so I, um, I have a, a, a two book contracts to, um, to write um, two books focused on Ignatius Sancho. So I was in London for my sabbatical to do some research um, on uh, Ignatius Sancho's letters. Um, Ignatius Sancho is, is an 18th century black man, um, wrote a series of letters. Um, he was a, a grocer. Um, his grocery shop is a couple of blocks away from Downing Street. Um, so he was literally at the center of London. Um, he was also the valet to very important um, uh, member of the nobility. So somebody who was really um, at the center of things going on in London. So his letters are incredibly vivacious. Um, they're um, just really dynamic, really wonderful. And they give you just this really vivid picture of 18th century Black London, um, 18th century London period. Um, and when, but the way that scholars have tended to focus on those letters is as is just this reflection of 18th century London. Um, but what they don't really focus on very closely is the fact that he is providing a glimpse into black London because he's married to a black woman. He has six kids, um, he has in-laws, all of that stuff. Um, so um, Ali had done this really great map um, focusing on, on um, pre-World War II London where he mapped 
um, the spaces um, that were connected to Black people in London before World War II um, in the 1930s. And I thought we could take that workflow um, and um, uh, gather together a research team of undergraduates and maybe do something similar for Ignatia Sancho. Um, so essentially crowdsourcing um, the research that I had to do, um, which was really lovely. Um, and um, I thought it would be um, really difficult to get the students um, to get involved in it, um, but it actually was not. The students loved the fact that they were helping me um, with my research. Um, and you know, I definitely will, they will get credit, obviously, um, in the book um, when it eventually comes out. Um, but they also found stuff that we didn't know um, existed. Um, so one of the students found an additional child of um, um, Ignatius Sancho, um, and she did this by just going on Ancestry.co.uk. I remember when she asked us, she said, you know, have you thought about looking there? We're like, no, you won't find anything there that will be useful. And of course, um, they did. They found this whole extra child that we didn't know it now existed. Um, so, um, uh, so I think I will just end there um, with this image, which is one of my favorite images. Um, so this is, um, as it says, Amori Boe Chin. She's going to graduate next year. She actually came to us as a law major um, and ended up changing her major to history because the project was so exciting and so um, interesting for her. Um, she felt that it really um, validated her existence um, as a Black British person that now she you know, um, knew about this much longer um, and very dynamic history. So what she's holding in her hand is actually a, a, an illustration of the street that Sancho's shop is on. Mm -hmm. um, and I wish that this had sound um, because she was literally squealing um, <laughs> and we kind of got in trouble um, by the archivists <laughs> um, because right there are all these people and they're doing their research and then you know we're really excited uh, to have found mm -hmm. this document that the archive they didn't even know that they had. Um, so um, yeah, I will just end there. Thank you. I have a few comments to make. I'm happy that the precedent has been set that I don't have to necessarily do a case study. So <laughs> as in economics, we really don't have an archive of any kind or we're not really assembling any kind of data repository. So the issues that I have or I deal with with regard to my students specific to social justice have really come out of my classes and my own personal interests. So I teach two classes. One is economics of crime, which automatically defaults to a racial issue, which is unfortunate, and the other uh, economics of race. And in both of these classes, I've had, because of my own relationships, I've had opportunities to invite students to partake in research. But the most important thing I think that I offer is a different perspective on these two issues of crime and of race. Because these are both in terms of our automatic assumption of ethnicity when it comes to crime, it tells us it's a social construct. Similarly, when we think about race, we know definitely it's a social construct. So in this particular case, both of them have also been based on economic phenomena from the standpoint of what most lay people think economics is, which is a financial return, the, uh, discipline. Economics is about fundamentally well-being. So it's really a more of a qualitative discipline, not a quantitative one. Our quantitative elements are really mostly aligned to the desire for legitimacy so that we can stand alongside the sciences, even though we have moral philosophy as our root. So I try to, to tie that into my coursework quite a bit and really bring in the one book that people don't quote enough about with regard to Adam Smith, which is a theory of moral sentiments. If you don't read that, you cannot understand what he's writing about in The Wealth of Nations because context frames every word that we read and context frames how we speak to one another. And oftentimes we neglect to just state what we mean by defining the words that we're using so the next person doesn't take it based on their assumption of what those words are. Even the simplest words such as education is, 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 a, is a misnomer for many people because they think of it as one thing think of, and when the reality is they're practicing it as totally different. For example, education is highly correlated to income. So most of our prejudices related to, income, uh, related to education are resulting in our, how we look at the person's income, right? So when you see someone in a certain occupation, you automatically sort of default to what you assumed your education must have been. So these are issues that we carry with us. And this is hopefully something that I convey to my students and hopefully something in years to come, if not immediately, um, 
that they will appreciate. That's all I, I, I can hope for. That's all any of us can hope for. But uh, because in my, in my different uh, avenues and, and areas of work, I have worked in, in areas related to justice because I'm also a, a prison a abolitionist. Um, and I also have had relationships with justice studies and in other institutions, as well as criminal justice departments and in other institutions, not so much ours, which I'd be happy to establish. <laughs> but um, I've been able to get my students if that are involved in areas of interest in the crime class automatically involved in perhaps presenting something at the justice studies conference. Justice studies conference is very small. So for an undergraduate student, for the first opportunity for them to go to an academic conference, it offers a wonderful opportunity to be around people who are supportive. They're not there trying to figure out what's wrong with what you've done. They're very supportive. It gives them the, the benefit of having that resume builder, but at the same time, also um, be amongst uh, other professors who are looking to help them feel enabled. How, how about that? That's the best way to put it. So I've had every year at least three students present at the Justice Studies Association annual meetings. Um, typically, they not none of them have actually had a published paper, I must admit. The only published papers I've had is, uh, since I've been at Northeastern, I've had at least, I think, maybe 15 co-written papers with my undergraduate students. This last year, two of them appeared in the, in the Contemporary Justice Review. One was because they had a special issue related to bell hooks. So one of them was related specifically to teaching race. How do you teach race? Because that seems to be a real problem for a lot of people. I really don't think it's a problem at all in our economics course, um, because it's easy to, to actually teach about race when you don't make it about hierarchy, when you explain the irrationality. Um, and you start from that perspective, it becomes more inclusive from the very beginning because everyone has experienced some aspect of that. So that automatically gives them a connection to, to it. Although for some people, the unfairness continues for a much longer period of time than others. So that's one aspect of, of, of that. The second paper that we that came out was a paper written with nine students and myself. It actually happened immediately after George Floyd. It was my economics of crime class. So after George Floyd, I had three students from prior sessions of the Econ of Crime class contact me, they'd already graduated and they were really upset about this and they really wanted to find out what they could do. So I offered it to my students, the current class, and I had six students wanna join in. So they all wrote different sections about aspects of how we could teach economics of crime based on our class. So there's a little bias towards me, of course, um, to teach it in a way that would get people to better understand the racial components of our, of our policing system and also of our legal system. And I really, I really think they did an amazing job. The, the paper is a very nice paper. I don't know if necessarily it met the needs of the journal special issue, but let's put it this way, it's when having, having relationships matters, right? <laughs> so two years after George Floyd, we, got, we finally got published last fall in that journal. So it was, it was very beneficial to them. Most of them had graduated, so I had to put it on LinkedIn because all of them I have connections on LinkedIn. So that's how they all found out because I mean, two years, undergrads don't understand how long things can take. Right? Um, so the other thing I do, it's not necessarily specifically social justice. I am the editor in chief of a journal called Sustainability and Climate Change. Most of my work in economics focuses on sustainability. So economics is the basis for why we're not sustainable, but economics could also be the reason for us being sustainable. What I'd, su what I'd suggest we all think about for just one second, this is what I stress in my classes, is what is missing in our demand function. Everybody learns it's your preferences, but if your values are also equally attributable to what is your responsibility, then it changes the whole outcome, right? We do not live by our values. We've sort of divested ourselves from our values and live in a marketplace that doesn't have to be operating based on values. It's a very interesting dynamic and it also ties very much to who created neoclassical economics because it opens a whole DEIB discussion to one that's very tangible to everyone. When you don't have representation of people across the board, then the frameworks that you use may only be representative of the few that get to make the decisions. And so if you don't understand what it feels like not to have free will, of course you're gonna to default to the fact that everybody has free will. So the whole concept of rationality in economics is based on this idea that we can make some choices because we have good information, but who has complete information? You have to be in a position of privilege to be able to have complete information. So 
when you start to incorporate these things in, it becomes very easy to understand how sustainability and economics are so tied together. I actually recognized this when I was a uh, non-academic, because I've only been back in the academic setting for the last 10 years. Before that, I was in a corporate setting for several years, and I started to do the sustainability reporting. And as you know, businesses are in the business to make money, but then you can start to see when you start to look at sustainability parameters, such as the GRI Global Reporting Initiative or CDP Carbon Disclosure Project, and other types of reporting mechanisms that look specifically to see the type of sustainability elements that you put into your investment portfolio, how beneficial it is for the corporation too, because you also end up having a stream of income that's more steady flow. So it's not exactly the same, but elements of social justice pervade sustainability as well, of course, because at the end of the day, our economic system thrives and is able to be maintained the way it is because we have to have a constant supply of exploitable people and exploitable resources, right? And as that is diminishing, we're starting to see probably more and more directly in our face uh, the implications of not living with our conscience. So that's what we teach in my sustainability class, not we, me, but mm -hmm. I, I, I use the we loosely. Hopefully the students also start to engage by the end of the semester, but that's where we are. So those three classes have, have come out with, like I said, I think I'd say 15 papers, but we have a couple coming out recently. They have yet to be, some of like I said, are really slow publishing, but a couple of them are related specifically to the sustainable development goals. And I've been sitting on a book <laughs> for three years. <laughs> It's called Economics of Sustainability, which could put me on the map because that's the name of my class. And there's only one other class like Econ of Sustainability, and that's at NYU, and it's not related to me. Somebody else came up with the same name. So I'm hoping that I'll finish it over the Christmas break because it doesn't really take a long time to write it. It's a question of being in the right mood to write things. Oftentimes, that's what ends up happening, I think, is that we just put it aside and put it aside. It's only gonna be a monograph. So it won't be like this huge, huge book, but it's just about, you know, it's enough for somebody to, to teach the class, but it'll have a component in it that I have not shared, which I am doing this class experimentally this semester. It's it actually bridges the gap between the two things that I mentioned at the beginning, the moral philosophical roots of economics and the practice of economics today. And the fact that we have sort of separated out the moral component from the practitioner component I teach a class called Religious Influences on Economics, because most of us have forgotten that religion is the basic, basic root and foundation for an economic system. Prior to the formalization of our current economic system, religion would have dictated what you could or could not do. And it would also have dictated the type of commerce you could or could not have. And that's one of the basic reasons why we see some major differences between certain countries that abided by certain religious theologies and others. So the reason why I think this is important too is because obviously we have a lot of attribution to religion that leads to adverse consequences for people who are not in the most popular religious belief paradigms. And um, that a lot of that is just unfortunately because we like to see the world as black and white and we don't recognize that we all live in the shades of gray and the false attributions that we give because stereotypes are faster to default to than actually getting to know somebody uh, make us make a lot of decisions that actually continue the polarization that we say we don't want. So uh, that, that is about all I have. I, I'm, gonna, I'm going to share with you. Uh, for me, it's a work in progress. So I get constant, uh, which I'm sure all my colleagues do, but in, 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 in my particular field is all I can really speak to. I get calls for papers or re requests to write papers. And in my classes, what I will do is I'll just ask my students if they'd like to participate. It gives them an opportunity to understand how to do the research. I typically am a little free with co-authorship because at this juncture and at this type of career that I have, uh, you know, sole authorship, it's, if it's a paper, is it really going to harm me uh, to give credit to my student, but it could actually benefit them quite a bit. So we have a few, uh, one last thing, which is, or two things actually, we have one paper coming out, which is related to my sustainability class, which we got because we had a guest speaker come to my class. And they're all, they all just did basically life cycle assessments of items that a marketing company gives away. And he's gonna post that on their web, on the marketing company's website, the Swag Cycle website. But we're also writing the paper for a, a, a book chapter that's coming out on marketing and how marketing has to change. Because even though this is directly social, it's, it's related to the fact that we give away products with branding on them, but that actually may reduce the life of, use life of them. And it also doesn't help align with the perhaps mission statement of the entity giving them away. 
We're also working on a set of curriculum items for a Canadian school system that comes out of a research report I did uh, related specifically to young people and their perceptions of sustainability. But unfortunately, everything I do is not related to a, an entity outside me. So I've, I've been speaking a little bit more about me, me, me. So I, I, will, I will stop right here. And I, hopefully, if there's anything I can address later, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we do have time for questions and discussion. Um, a couple, and I think we can just, people can, we can do that from, from people's seats. Um, I think we probably have someone, maybe Tanya, um, who will be able to tell us if we have any online questions. Um, I thought there was one other piece of housekeeping. I, oh yes, if you ask a question, if when you ask a question, you do not state who you are, a hole will open up beneath you and you will drop to the center of the earth, okay? So you don't want to find out whether I'm telling the truth or not. Um, so please do, uh, when you ask a question, um, identify yourself. Um, and uh, I hope I haven't frightened people off of asking questions. So, yes. Hello, my name is Desport. I'm the admin assistant for the political science department. Um, I have questions for both, actually for all of you. Let me just start with one person. Um, for KJ, I guess my first question is like general terms that you're using for collecting your data. Uh, you mentioned that you have the students kind of like changing the language so that it'll be better, it'll be easier for people to find information in their data. What do those look like? What are those general terms, I guess? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's part of the most interesting intellectual work, I think, of students' participation in the project, um, because especially with even just the term transgender, which is so ubiquitous in our current parlance, but it has a very short history. So the first time I've been able to find it in print is 1965. Wow. And it really started to gain widespread circulation in the 90s. So when you think about historical research, it's practically useless, uh, especially if you're going back to, you know, 18th century. Um, so we have a, a really interesting set of resources, which um, provides some of the earlier terminology that people can use to find uh, materials. And even things like um, in the dress of, or in the disguise of, or in the guise of. So there's like certain phrases that we use that will often get us um, pretty close, if not right, onto materials that relate to gender transgressive practices in the past. But because current researchers don't know that language, the students are involved in that interesting translation process um, while being sensitive to not impose current identities mm -hmm. onto historical subjects. So we try to keep some space between like the database terms and the materials themselves. Um, but it's a really um, interesting tension that we often have to navigate. Does that frustrate students at all? The sort of that, that you can't always, that there's a distance between past and present identities? It does, but in it's actually usually the opposite, is that they're so sensitive to people's self-representation that they like don't want to impose identities. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so we often default to describing practice rather than identity. So we'll, we'll say cross-dressing rather than cross-dresser. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's just one example of the ways that we can try to describe the thing, but it's really hard to once you want to get more specific than that. So we might use something like trans-feminine, but that's obviously like a very recent framing, but like it helps them to sort of build that lineage. So do you want to ask one more? Go through. Okay. Uh, <laughs> one more. <laughs> um, sixth person. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Nicole? For you, Nicole. Um, I guess for the students who are reading the more heavier um, works to find the embedded slave narratives, uh, what kind of support do you have in place for the students experiencing that? Um, so we do, we have the weekly meetings, um, and so we talk about, um, you know, um, you know, very early on, we talk about the kinds of things that they might encounter. Um, I share a lot of my experiences of working in the archives um, and doing this work um, and how, how difficult it is. Um, I mean, we talk about, you know, making sure that they are in a I mean, and this is going to sound kind of waffly, um, but right, so emphasizing self-care, um, you know, and if you need to take a step back, you know, that's completely fine. You don't need to make yourself, you know, read, because these documents 
that, I mean, really awful, awful things um, are around them. Um, so, so yeah, just attending to the fact that, and acknowledging that it is um, difficult work and that there's no such thing as objectivity, it's completely okay. Um, and you've heard me run down Brian Edwards already. Um, <laughs> I've said worse things um, in a group setting. Um, so, so yeah, I think, you know, um, humanizing it, but also, you know, acknowledging that it is a, um, it is difficult um, and allowing them to take, you know, take the time um, to, um, to process that they don't need to do it right away. I actually, um, is there something online, Tanya? Okay, so that allows me to ask my question. And, and you sort of started, I think everyone started to address this a little bit, but just to kind of give the frame a fuller flip, can you talk a little bit, well, let me ask the question in sort of the most sort of negative possible way, um, which is, well, okay, let me ask it in a middle way. How do you balance the amount of time that involving novice researchers in what in every case is your work, right? The amount of time and training and support that that takes, does that balance out with a degree to which having that involvement actually helps advance your research. Do you understand what I'm at? Like, what's the, what's the kind of ratio between like, this research is important to me and I would get more of it done if I didn't have this involvement versus, wow, like having this involvement helped me discover a new document or helps me crowdsource a question. Um, so just whoever, anyone would like to address like what that balance is. Okay, Monica. Last man out. So. Um, the reality is, you have to teach them skills. In my case, they're just doing research. They're learning how to do literature review. They're learning how to back up information. In some cases, they may collect data. But data, you know, I'm not. A, I'm, I, I can do quantitative, although obviously we can't get our economics PhDs without it. But I, I, I do believe that um, we do need to delve in the realm of the qualitative more, because the quantitative is an easy proxy. But if you don't understand the context, applying the quantitative skills is really going to get you a very bad answer. So I focus on them learning that APA citation style is what I use and what my journal uses. So that actually takes a little bit more time. And that's something that I always try to tell them is portable. They can take that with them wherever they go. And it's very important to learn how to cite your work. Um, but I guess they're not writing 90% of the paper I am. They're writing 10%. And even that, I have oversight and I check. So the encumbersome component of their, their inclusion is minor. I'd say what I, the problem with me is that I have four or five research projects at any given time, and each one, I am the only person having the meeting with them every week. Mm -hmm. So you, that's- You've that's, written to me about this before. Yeah, <laughs> and I could have even more of them than those projects, but I don't have the bandwidth to do that. So that's the, that's the bigger challenge. Thank you. Yeah, Nicole, you might as well just. Yeah, yeah, yes, I, I would agree. It's it's actually not so terrible. Uh, I mean, it, it make it, it it's it's right. I mean, it, it sounds like it is right that that you know you're you're not the one who's in the archive, you know, asking these questions, that kind of thing. I um, mean that you know, obviously, if I was there, I might look differently. Um, but um, I've actually found it to be really wonderful experience um, to basically um, to say to them, this is what we did with the. Um, Sancho project, the, the students kept coming back to us initially and they're saying, just tell us what to do mm -hmm. um, and tell us what to look for. And I'm like, I can't do that. Um, you need to figure out, you know, what, how you're going to look for. I've told you the parameters, right? That we want you to pay attention to the stuff that's going on around in the letters, the places, the people, the things that Sancho is talking about. And however you want to organize that, however you want to engage with that, um, you know, that's, you know, you need to develop your own research process. Um, so um, that was, and, and that's what I found gratifying is that they don't, right, they don't look in the way that I would have looked. Um, so that that's the really wonderful part about this exercise. And so I don't, um, that's why I don't think about it as, as onerous, um, because initially, it's hard, I would, I mean, I totally could default to, I want you to look at this, and I want you to look at it in this, in this manner. But then, Right, it's 
I, I would have to keep monitoring them and all of that stuff. And then I might not get really interesting information because they might overlook it because that's not what I told them to look for. So if I don't tell them what to look for, um, they're more likely um, to find some really interesting stuff um, or um, even the process that they come up with. I mean, that was the really wonderful thing in terms of, so just to speak concretely, um, Ali and I came up with a, um, a data set spreadsheet. Um, and we thought that we had identified all of the columns that we would need so the students wouldn't have to do that. The students actually were in the archives and they're like, well, you know, we actually need more columns that do this and this other thing. And, you know, and so, and they really um, added this really lovely textual quality to the, um, to the material that we, we hadn't even considered. Um, so, I mean, they saved us time. Mm -hmm. um, in that. Um, so I don't, I don't necessarily think that it's a, you know, either or kind of thing where that mm -hmm. one thing is more complicated um, than the other. I think, you know, with any kind of educational, right, activity, right, there's the scaffolding, and then there's what the students will actually do, right, with the, with, with the project, and that's like the really cool part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, KJ? Yeah, I mean, I could almost just echo everything <laughs> that Nicole has just said. Um, you know, there would be no DTA without students. So it, I, I don't ever mm -hmm. see them as like owners to the project in that way. Um, but I think it's always been important to me too to not see my role as providing the container and that they fill it in, right? So the equivalent of adding columns to the spreadsheet is that, you know, even a few weeks ago, my students came to me out of the blue and said, we think that the explicit content policy needs to change and here's why. And they had written a proposal. Wow. <laughs> Fantastic. Let's look at it together. Right. And then so I think that that to me is like one of the best markers of success is when like students really take ownership of not just the content, but the framing and the structure and the, the sort of interventions that a project can have. Um, and so it's transformative for the work. OK, I have to know what was it that they were identifying about the explicit content um, <laughs> warning that that was not working for them. Yeah, so for certain types of explicit content, we have a pop-up and our, our framework is like feminist and that we want people to consent, right? That they are opting in to see things. And they were like pushing back because they were like, that's too broad. We needed to specify what type of explicit content mm -hmm. is behind the pop-up mm -hmm. because we need to know what we're opting into mm -hmm. because it could be racist imagery. It could be, um, it could be nudity and, and because of, the way that United States laws work, we have to mark above the waist feminine presenting nudity. And they're like, I don't care if I'm looking at nipples, but I don't want to see blackface, right? Or that I don't want to see X. And so their proposal was to change the policy so that it's more specific, so that they knew exactly what they were opting into. And I thought that was a fantastic suggestion. It sounds complicated operationally. It is, and it's going to take a lot of money and work to do, but it needs to happen. All right. Um, don't avoid the pit that might drop. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I, I could use that pit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Laurie Love. Good try. <laughs> I'm in the English department. So uh, share to the colleagues on this panel. This is such great stuff. And it's so nice to see our students engaged in this way. I wanted to ask about the relationship between research discovery, which is a lot of what at least these two projects are about and analysis um, and our, uh, I mean, if these, I, I'm not clear if these are classes or research projects that students are opting into, but in the course of sort of um, using students to further research in courses that we teach, um, how do you, like, where's, what's the analytic component? Because Clearly, research, I mean, I've used graduate research assistants very occasionally, but they like really help. They bring me so much <laughs> stuff, but they're not really doing the kind of brain work and, mm -hmm. and selection and that I would feel is responsible if I were teaching them a class in either research methods or contributing to modifying a thesis of whatever it is I was working on. Or like, it's awesome that they found a child. Oh my God. <laughs> but you know, okay, they found a child. Now, what do you do with that? And yeah. May I start again? I, I know that I don't have a project, but um, in my weekly, when, we, when my students start to work with me, I don't assume that they have any context or understanding about the particular project that we're going to be working on. My projects are short term because they're coming to a fruition at the, the publication and hopefully of the paper. But what we do is initially meet every single week and we just discuss literature that I gave them to read so they start to have a better comprehensive understanding of the issue, of the topic. Then when we get to a certain point based on the abstract that I have written that, I, that I'm going to be proposing and sending out, 
I have them look at the different questions that I've created and composed that would help me further the paper where they are able to assist me. And I let them pick each question. That way they have their interpretation of how they're going to look at that question. They're doing the literature review to support the answer to that question. So they're able to develop critical thinking skills, which is the whole point of this. And then I may or may not use what they end up with, but they have had a learning experience, which hopefully bonds them a little bit more to me too. And um, definitely gives me an ability to help them during that path. We have time for either Nicole or KJ. Oh, no, 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 that's not you. It's just the time. Sure. I mean, so that all of the, the EBBDA projects have analysis, right? So they're they're basically um, digital visual essays is what the students are creating. Um, and in terms of the mapping Black London, um, we're working on that. I see. Um, so they have wonderful ideas um, about possibilities, but we're creating in the middle of creating that new website. Um, so it just hasn't manifested itself. Um, but it is a component that we usually talk about it in our meetings and things like that. So, I can tell you about it after, but the quick answer is, if you change what the analytical outcome looks like, they're often more well positioned to create that content than I am. So Wikipedia pages, for example, they do a better job at writing than I do. So. Sure, yeah. So I just want to close also by thanking the staff members who always support um, not only uh, the wonderful lunch that if you haven't helped yourself to any, please do. Um, but also the, um, the technology that has enabled uh, remote attendance and will enable people to hear this really wonderful panel later on. That is uh, Max, Abhishek, Tanya, and I'm so sorry. I'm just- Diana. And Diana. Mm -hmm. So thank you all very much. Thanks to the Humanities Center and my colleagues in the Dean's office. And thank you all for a really wonderful and inspiring um, set of pedagogical and, and research um, thoughts and questions. So thank you. Yeah, I've heard from Gretchen. Yeah, and we're 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 in contact. Yep. No, I I have. Yeah. Oh, I will.